disease going on in the markets and uh, what should be done about it. Uh, yesterday, um, we um, listened to Olivier Blanchard on fiscal policy and so today, financial markets. Um, I will uh, invite everyone to um, shoot questions via the chat button. Um, you can just uh, share them with everybody and I will then uh, group them by topic and um, give them to Daryl so you don't have to uh, multitask too much, Daryl. It's difficult enough with this technology. Um, so we're aiming for about a 45-minute presentation and then some Q&A at the end. So with that, we go over to you, Daryl, and thank you so much for doing this. Uh, Luke, thank you so much. Uh, it's a great opportunity to engage with you and uh, to find out what kinds of issues you're thinking about as well. <clears throat> so I hope this will be lively. I'm not going to present uh, a paper, but rather just a selection of issues that have come up in my policy conversations since the crisis began um, that might be relevant uh, to what you're thinking. I'm not really sure. Uh, most of my focus is on uh, U.S. Uh, central bank policy. Uh, so. What I'm going to do is share the screen in a moment, uh, go through uh, a list of the issues, and then uh, dive a little bit more deeply into each, but uh, not in, not in uh, extremely fine detail, and invite a conversation um, about, about some of these issues. I'm actually making a related conversation this afternoon with the Fed, and so this will be a good uh, a good chance for me to find out how central bankers are thinking about some of these issues. So at this point, let me try to share my screen. Anna Maria uh, was very helpful uh, in teaching me how to do this. Uh, can somebody verify that you're actually seeing my screen? Yes, it's all, it's all good. Okay, good. Uh, <clears throat> so just to, uh, there's one issue in here that's, uh, that I think you'll agree should be uh, treated as confidential. Uh, so I mark these slides preliminary and confidential. <clears throat> so here's the issues uh, that, uh, that I think are worth discussing, maybe in rank order of in interest or importance. Um, so the first one is a concern that's arisen in the United States uh, with the exceptional growth in central bank deposits over the last month. Now over a trillion of additional reserves uh, in, the, in the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve System. And uh, what happens as the Fed continues to expand its balance sheet uh, with the uh, impact of the leverage ratio rule those reserves will begin to crowd out credit provision and market making inventories unless uh, something is done. And the Fed has already taken some actions uh, to relieve this uh, crowding out effect um, by relaxing the leverage ratio rule. Uh, but that's not necessarily going to work. And I'm also wondering what other central banks may be doing in this area as they expand their own balance sheets and central bank deposits start to um, impinge on commercial bank balance sheet space under the leverage ratio rule. So we'll come back to that. The second issue, and this is the one that I think uh, should be treated as confidential, um, is the idea that as um, banks start to experience losses, they will tend um, uh, by, in order to maximize shareholder value, they will tend to react to their um, uh, leverage and risk-based capital requirements by reducing uh, their balance sheets rather than by expanding the amount of capital. In other words, if you think of uh, a capital ratio requirement as having both a numerator, capital, and a denominator, assets, banks can maintain their capital ratios by reducing assets rather than increasing capital as they, um, as they start to lose money. And uh, I want to discuss the possibility, and this is quite hypothetical, of adding a temporary floor on the quantity of capital in euros um, as opposed to a ratio-based requirement. 
and I'm doing some modeling of this right now uh, that I'll describe, although the results are not quite ready yet. We just started last weekend because uh, of the interest in this topic. The third uh, topic area is how to think about um, bank, big bank credit spreads during a stress period like this um, as a gauge of bank quality. Um, and I've been watching uh, bank equity levels, at least market value of equity levels are extremely low, but credit spreads are surprisingly muted. And uh, in order to try to disentangle uh, the implications for um, the solvency or risk of banks, um, we have to remove the effects of creditor assumptions about state support uh, to try to take those out of the credit spreads and see what what the credit spreads might be telling us. And uh, I've been doing some work on this for the United States, but my work on this for Euro with uh, on the European scene is in progress. I don't have any empirical results yet, but I want to tell you what I'm doing. And then time permitting, which may not happen, um, a couple of other issues that I've been thinking about, um, policy issues. One is pro-cyclical margin requirements. As yet, uh, I've noticed in Europe, for example, sovereign credit spreads are also muted, um, but that leaves an opportunity um, for, uh, in the event that uh, some sovereign credit spreads start to rise for some pro-cyclicality in the assignment of haircuts and margins uh, that could uh, place, that could magnify stresses. And then finally, I have some uh, concerns on behalf of, uh, you know, thinking about uh, central bank policymakers as they face in the United States um, the request from the government uh, to fund uh, uh, corporations with subsidized loans in order to preserve jobs, uh, which is a, a beneficial objective, uh, but may um, cause some issues for the Federal Reserve uh, in terms of its mission and its political independence. So I can come back to those last two issues, uh, time permitting and interest permitting. And I'm going to go back to the very first issue now, which is uh, the effect of crowding out of reserves uh, uh, by reserves of other uh, market-making inventories. And I would suggest as we walk into this um, that rather than waiting to the very end, uh, that maybe we sh if it's okay with you, Luke, uh, to take comments after each of these topics because they're they're somewhat separable and people may lose track of what they wanted to ask or or uh, the topicality may decline as we go through this. Absolutely. Um, I'm just collecting all the the comments via the chat and then we'll pass them on to you. <clears throat> okay. So on this first topic, um, the um, the federal the Federal Reserve uh, has added about a trillion dollars of central bank deposits, um, and it's using uh, those newly created reserves to purchase assets. Basically, taking uh, mostly treasuries, about 1.3 trillion in treasuries, and some other assets. And now it's beginning to expand its um, emergency lending, and will continue to use reserves mostly to purchase uh, more assets or to make more loans. And as those uh, reserves are being added, of course, the commercial banking system is a closed system. They have to be held by commercial banks. And uh, those commercial banks are under uh, capital requirements. And one worries that there will be space left for banks uh, to provide intermediation and credit provision. Um, at the same time, the customers of banks are drawing on their credit lines and increasing their deposits, which further expands uh, uh, bank balance sheets and puts further pressure on, on their uh, capital requirements. Now, some, there's some overlap there because some of those <clears throat> deposits are being invested in reserves, but not all of them. So uh, as the crisis proceeds and central bank balance sheets get bigger and bigger, uh, the headroom available under the leverage ratio rule is declining. <clears throat> now, one could say the same thing about tier, uh, tier one uh, risk-based capital requirements. 
but there is something that can be done um, with respect to the leverage ratio rule, I think, um, for two reasons. Number one, that's the one that's um, the, uh, the leverage ratio rule applies uh, to reserves uh, in the same way that it applies to any risky assets, but reserves are not risky, so there's some space uh, to make adjustments there. Just to give you an example, I went to the, the, this week's uh, first quarter report for J.P. Morgan Chase, and their balance sheet has grown by $450 billion in assets in the first quarter, almost all of it due to um, crisis effects. And at the same time, uh, the headroom that they have available under the supplementary leverage ratio has been reduced by 30 basis points, which is quite a bit. <clears throat> and that uh, those SLR numbers are not very volatile normally. They had, for J.P. Morgan Chase, there had been no change in the previous year, and suddenly a 30 basis point um, a reduction in uh, capital according to the supplementary leverage ratio rule. At the same time, uh, loan loss provisions uh, jumped for, for JP Morgan jumped up this quarter by 77%, and they had been dead flat for the previous year. So to have no change four quarters in a row and then a 77% increase in one quarter suggests the degree of severity of this crisis um, on bank earnings. So it happens that JP Morgan Chase is one of those kinds of banks that can continue to earn money even in a crisis, and so it, it doesn't have negative earnings. Uh, but uh, maybe for other banks, um, these losses will further reduce headroom uh, uh, available under, uh, under capital ratios, and something may need to be done about that, which I'll get to later. The Fed uh, was not unaware of this problem, and on April 1st, it uh, temporarily exempted treasuries and reserves from the supplementary leverage ratio rule for bank holding companies, and it hinted that it may exempt uh, treasury repos. And we can talk about that hinting uh, if you're interested. It's quite, there's quite a, a nice little backstory there. <clears throat> uh, the, and the Fed was very explicit in its uh, temporary revision of Regulation Q uh, by saying that they are indeed concerned um, that as banks accumulate treasuries and reserves uh, due to the crisis, uh, that their incentives and ability to prov continue providing intermediation to the economy may be cramped. Unfortunately, uh, two other regulators have to sign off uh, for the bank subsidiaries, which are the holders of the reserves. So the FDIC and the OCC, which are the two other large bank regulators in the U.S., have not allowed uh, exemptions under the uh, leverage ratio rules for the banks themselves. <clears throat> so even though the Fed uh, has mitigated the problem at the holding company level, which includes the dealers, the banks themselves, which also hold the dealers' reserves, uh, continue to accumulate reserves with no relief under the supplementary leverage ratio rule. Uh, in my Buffy lecture, uh, I spoke about the fact that this is this imposing the SLR on things like reserves and treasury repos is counterproductive because these are extremely safe assets, and imposing um, those leverage-based rules on extremely safe assets will have the effect of crowding out intermediation of other sorts. And now the uh, general uh, reasoning that I provided has become uh, kind of exigent. The Fed has only done this temporarily. That's one year. And uh, market commenters are asking, well, how will the Fed uh, exit this temporary relief? I would suggest that it doesn't exit it. And I know this, uh, for some people in the policy community, this is heresy because um, the there are good reasons uh, to have leverage ratio rules. I just think that they are dominated by the bad reasons to have them, uh, the damage that they're causing to intermediation. And I'm, I'd be happy to discuss that further. Now, I'm assuming that banks won't issue new equity. Uh, I'm going to discuss in a moment the possibility of mitigating that problem. But assuming that banks will not issue new equity, unexempted reserves uh, will eventually crowd out the incentives for banks to offer robust credit provision and market making. 
Um, I'm not sure that's true in Europe, um, but I'm pretty sure it's true in the United States where the SLR is, uh, is uh, bigger for GSIBs, quite a bit bigger. If a central bank or a bank regulator were to say, well, um, we don't want to exempt reserves because then bank capital uh, levels will go down, I describe in my Buffy lecture how that can be sterilized by increasing other capital requirements and still maintaining the objective of the leverage ratio rule on a system-wide basis. The idea being one calculates how much capital in the system should be based on the leverage ratio rule, but one does not apply the leverage ratio rule to each bank. One simply adds uh, other capital requirements until the objectives of the leverage ratio rule are met on a system-wide basis. Uh, so th this effect can be sterilized. And uh, when the Bank of England exempted reserves uh, a few years ago, they did uh, sterilize it by increasing other capital requirements, which I thought was a prudent move. Although I noticed that uh, some in the central banking community didn't like the idea that one central bank would depart from the norm set in Basel. And I think uh, there are good reasons for Basel to revisit the whole issue of leverage ratio rules, but that's a longer story. Okay, I'm going to move to the issue of enhancing capital requirements in a moment. But Luke, um, if anybody wants to comment on this or if there's chat about this issue, we could do that now. Well, there is sort of a more general question, Daryl, from uh, Simone Manganelli. Um, how, do you, how should we deal with cliff effects related to rating downgrades? So this you may talk about later on post-cyclicality issues, but it's a pertinent issue uh, for discussion in Europe, sort of these cliff effects from rating downgrades. Uh, there, that's a very uh, apt uh, question under this issue of pro-cyclicality. And uh, just for sake of clarity, until two years ago, I had been on the board of Moody's Corporation, the board of directors, for 10 years. And this issue of pro-cyclicality comes up all the time. And credit rating agencies are under quite a lot of pressure because on the one hand, um, as they were recently advised by Stephen Mayor, the head of ESMA, um, uh, their ratings downgrades recently have been adding pro-cyclicality. Uh, but on the other hand, the rating agencies are not uh, policy, um, they don't have policy objectives. They have the objective of providing um, guidance on credit quality. So um, I, I would not um, suggest, and actually uh, the chair of ESMA did not um, actually suggest calling on rating agencies to do that, but rather to have them thinking about it. But I would not suggest that rating agencies be prevented from providing downgrades whenever they are reasonable. However, policymakers will have to make a judgment about how to mitigate that pro-cyclicality. I had a discussion earlier this week with um, a senior executive at a large uh, central counterparty about the issue of counter-cyclicality. And this issue of credit rating downgrades came up in that discussion as well. And uh, if we get to pro-cyclicality, maybe we could raise it again there. But, but it is true, um, as, um, as the question suggests, that ratings downgrades are pro-cyclical. In some cases, they automatically trigger haircut increases or higher margin requirements or preclude for certain types of collateral from being used as margin. Uh, and that is an accelerator uh, that needs to be dealt with. And there's also a question, Daryl, uh, from Isabel Schnabel, um, more on the topic of the leverage ratio. Uh, what do you think about designing leverage ratios in a macroprudential way, similar to the counter-cyclical capital buffer? Um, I think that's a very good idea. I'm um, a, a fan of countercyclical buffers. I would suggest, again, applying it on a system-wide basis. So just to repeat the formula, every bank reports its uh, assets just as under the leverage ratio rule. The regulator uh, and, and reports what its um, capital would be required under that rule, but that's not the binding constraint on that particular bank. Rather, the regulator adds up all of those capital requirements uh, determines how much capital would be needed in the system or large bank system based on that rule, and then increases other capital requirements uh, to meet that level if that's the binding uh, constraint. 
in that way, you get you get the effect of the leverage ratio rule, but no individual bank is is causing distortions because it doesn't internalize very much um, uh, the purchase its own asset balance sheet with respect to this um, leverage ratio rule, and that could be done on a counter cyclical way. Uh, and I think it's a great idea to do that. And then there is a last question from Klaus Massow on this. Um, you get the example of JP Morgan in the, in the US, which is reasonably well capitalized. Uh, unfortunately, in Europe, uh, many capital ratios of banks are somewhat lower, and especially market to book ratios are low. And um, so you making the assumption of no issuance of new bank equity, but in the case of Europe, should we be thinking of recapitalizing banks more upfront? Uh, my answer to that is yes, and it's the next topic. Uh, so whenever you like, we can move on to that. Uh, okay, so let me, let me move ahead to that topic, and we, that doesn't rule out coming back to the topic of the leverage ratio rule. <clears throat> so uh, this, um, just to, maybe I'll, I'll uh, go back to where this came up at a conversation with Tim Geithner in the Federal Reserve in 2007, Jeremy Stein uh, and I got into a discussion about um, this issue of banks will simply meet their capital requirements um, by reducing the sizes of their balance sheets so that they don't need to raise equity. And Jeremy made the astute uh, point, well, during um, a period of concern, perhaps um, the banks could be required to maintain the numerator dollars of uh, capital. And so it won't do them any good to reduce the denominator. They simply have to maintain the numerator or dollars of capital. And so I decided, I, I actually have been suggesting this uh, in my recent policy discussions over the last few weeks because I'm concerned um, uh, by this uh, by this same issue. So this is uh, so last weekend. I, I uh, my student Timur Sobolev, who's because of the uh, social distancing measures, uh, is is at home in Moscow. I uh, I invited him to work with me on uh, modeling this effect. So let me outline the policy, and then how the model works if we have time. Uh, but unfortunately, Timor is still uh, coding up the uh, the results, so I don't have I don't have output yet to show you. I will in a few days. So here's how the rule goes. Uh, well, first, uh, just just to remind, when a when a bank's uh, loan default rates or NPLs are expected to be high for some period of time, like during a crisis that we're experiencing. The capital regulation, which says that capital over assets has to be at least a given ratio, could incite reduced lending and reduced market making. And the reason is that the banks uh, will not issue equity unless forced to because it's bad for their legacy shareholders. It will reduce return on equity. It's better for the bank to avoid making its balance sheet safer and transferring value to creditors. The bank uh, would rather uh, would rather just simply reduce assets selectively, provide less intermediation. There is, however, an idea which is uh, during this uh, crisis period, however long it lasts, uh, telling banks, uh, whatever your assets are, it doesn't matter. You must have at least a certain number of euros of capital in excess of some floor, which would be around um, where capital is right now, or uh, possibly a bit higher or possibly a bit lower, depending on on uh, the uh, the impact that you're willing to create with this, because this this would be extremely unpopular to say the least. Uh, first, um, a bank uh, executives uh, would scream uh, about it uh, because it it would really reduce the market value of their equity, given the inability. Uh, um, of banks uh, uh, to um, reduce to to meet their capital requirements by reducing assets. This is quite expensive for bank shareholders. Uh, so why do it? Well, there's two reasons to do it. One is 
I think it was in the premise uh, of the question, uh, to keep banks a source of strength to the economy, not to let their solvency come into question. Uh, and so um, maintain capital from a financial stability viewpoint. The other one, which is the one that I think is more fun to model at least, and more interesting for credit and loan provision, uh, um, is, is that when this floor is binding and uh, assets are strictly below regulatory requirements, uh, the bank will have a positive incentive to increase its assets and retain the earnings. Uh, and uh, that's an outcome of the model, but it's kind of intuitively obvious uh, that if you have headroom under your uh, uh, capital requirements based on the size of your balance sheet, you might as well use that headroom while this um, floor on, on capital um, is binding. Then the floor could be removed at the end of the crisis. Um, the bad news, as I mentioned, is that announcing a floor will reduce the market price of a bank's equity. And certainly if it's, if it's done um, too late or too early, it'll be worse. If, uh, too early meaning you, well, you, that is too aggressively. Uh, if you put a floor that's much, much higher than current bank capital, uh, then that's uh, going to reduce the current share price of bank equity a lot. It will make the system safer. It will provide incentives for uh, intermediation that are stronger, um, uh, but legacy share prices of bank equity will drop and it's possible the market will get confused about what that means. Uh, this is a, a debt overhang effect, it's pure debt overhang. Um, so one needs to be careful about how it's announced and if I were you I wouldn't talk about it externally uh, unless and until you know what you're going to do about it and then be very cautious about communicating it. And I, and I, uh, I would advise any policymaker to, to do the same. Another concern is that if it's done too late, um, under stress, uh, a rights offering would be required at a deep discount. Winnie Credit had one of those about five years ago that uh, during, uh, now it's uh, seven years ago, I think during the sovereign debt crisis, and uh, it almost uh, didn't get the rights offering off because even though it was at a deep discount, um, um, uh, the market was spooked by um, the the steep discount and the weak demand. So these these if it's done during a stress period where there's actually concern about the bank solvency, uh, the underwriting of these of the share issuances that might be necessary should have a government backstop. Um, and so that requires that's not a central bank issue. That's a finance ministry issue. But that's to ensure that there's confidence that the banks will be able to recapitalize rather than having a failed rights offering. Uh, so that's, um, that's the idea. I think I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the modeling of it, which is on the next slide, uh, and uh, uh, which uh, is a simple model that uh, demonstrates the, the effect of applying this floor on improving the um, incentives of banks uh, to make markets and to provide credit to the economy. Uh, and maybe if there's any discussion, we could do that now, uh, Luke. Well, there are no further questions at this moment, so we could move on. Yeah, okay, very good. Oh, uh, this is just uh, to make the point in reverse um, about the incentives associated with capital requirements for growing assets. So this is the perverse effect of the same phenomenon, which is showing the total assets on this slide of large U.S. banks uh, leading up to the financial crisis and then afterwards. And it, it's quite uh, dramatically clear from the slides that when capital requirements were not tight, banks were very happy to expand their balance sheets and provide aggressive uh, uh, market making and credit provision, uh, which is what policymakers would like to see, except that they didn't they didn't realize at the time in the U.S. at least uh, that uh, the the low capital requirements were also causing extreme financial instability. Post crisis, capital requirements are much tighter, and correspondingly, uh, the 
rate of growth of assets of banks is muted, despite um, reasonable economic growth in the United States. Uh, so again, the lesson the lesson of this is if uh, banks have loose capital requirements, um, they're going to expand their balance sheets. But you don't need to make loose capital requirements and have financial instability. You can impose a floor on capital, and then when assets fall below um, the ratio-based capital requirements, there will be an incentive to grow assets back up again, just as existed uh, in the U.S. before the financial crisis. So this is a good anti-cyclical uh, capital requirement uh, to apply during a period um, over which uh, bank earnings are expected to be low and bank capital might, might, uh, might be insufficient. Uh, definitely, I would not advise just lowering capital requirements, except uh, insofar as removing countercyclical buffers, which is what they're there for. That's the model I'm going to skip. Uh, and there's two uh, figures that are being plotted based on that model, and I'm going to go to uh, the last topic. Um, the last topic uh, that I want to mention, which is. Uh, how to interpret bank credit spreads uh, for the effect of too big to fail. And I actually spoke about this, Luke, I don't know if you remember, in a very preliminary uh, version um, at the ECB um, over a year ago. Uh, but I'm just going to review uh, what I did with my collaborators, Antia Berndt and Yi Chao Ju. So what we did is we tried to estimate how much uh, too big to fail presumption of creditors has disappeared since since the financial crisis. The idea being that after the financial crisis, with both the failure of Lehman and failure uh, new uh, bail-in based uh, failure resolution requirements, creditors uh, began to believe uh, that the state support would decline, uh, would not be there as it was before the financial crisis. And uh, the credit spreads of large U.S. banks actually went up, despite those banks being much better capitalized. In our empirical analysis, uh, we estimated that effect for uh, U.S. GSIBs and for U.S. domestically systemically important banks uh, that are shown on this, on this uh, slide. And I'm just going to give you the bottom line in terms of how to interpret the credit spreads. Um, before I do that, let me just give you an idea of what um, heightened credit spreads and improved capital, how those can uh, be resolved. Again, it sounds strange. Banks are much better capitalized, and yet they have much higher credit spreads. The only way to resolve it is to lower the probability that creditors assign that they'll get bailed out. And uh, this slide shows the implication of that. Um, the, what is plotted here is the credit spread at five years in the form of a CDS rate fitted to, from the data for all U.S. Uh, operating companies and large banks, uh, fitted to a large bank that's always got a two standard deviation capital buffer. Um, and let me interpret the slide. Before, this is the blue line, before uh, the failure of Lehman, a bank with a two standard deviation capital buffer had a credit spread of between 50 and 100 basis points. After the failure of Lehman, and on, actually the same thing is through uh, 2018 now, the bank of the same quality, still two standard deviation capital buffer, has a credit spread that's on the order of 200 to 250 basis points. Uh, so around 150 basis points more. And why is that? Well, one reason is that um, default risk premia have generally risen, so some of the effect is accounted for by that. But most of the effect is a presumption by creditors that they won't get bailed out after the crisis. Uh, and the data are remarkably um, 
uh, uh, speak remarkably strongly on this point. Uh, so no matter how we shake the model and look at the data, it always comes out that the implied, the market implied probability of a bailout goes way down. So for example, if the probability of a bailout were 0.65 in the US before the financial crisis, then it's dropped to about 0.2 on a market implied basis. The red dotted line shows what those credit spreads would be if the bad old days were still present and creditors still believe that they're going to get bailed out with probability 0.65. So those credit spreads would be much smaller, uh, between 100 and 150 basis points, which is typical um, of, of some large banks today. Now, why am I telling you, why am I explaining this in the context of the COVID-19 crisis? Um, well, I'm, I'm going through this because when I look at large bank credit spreads around the world, I'm wondering, uh, well, is this bank really okay? It only has a credit spread of 150 basis points. Uh, that's not bad. Or is it the case uh, that in this uh, jurisdiction, creditors still presume um, that there's state support. Now, I'm not saying anything about what, um, uh, state, what state support actually exists or whether a bail-in could be successfully uh, conducted. This is not about what governments uh, intend to do or regulators intend to do with respect to triggering a resolution. This is about what creditors believe uh, that the official sector will do. And if creditors believe that they're still getting state support, then the price of the cost of credit to banks will be bid uh, down. And the spreads that we're looking at may not be representative of the actual uh, solvency of those banks. Uh, now, I know you have independent um, sources of information on bank solvency. Uh, but this is a, uh, a market, market prices are usually quite helpful and the market equity prices of European banks, are, as was mentioned in, uh, earlier, are extremely low uh, to the point of being uh, for two of the largest banks in the Eurozone on the order of uh, 1% or less of uh, total assets uh, on the balance sheet, uh, which is a very, very low credit spread. Um, on the other hand, equity prices also uh, have to be interpreted. Um, it's not all insolvency risk. Uh, some of it is expectations of declines in earnings or negative earnings. So basically, the incentives of the bank manager uh, are to keep the banks going, even if shareholders might be better off if the banks were um, uh, liquidated or merged. Uh, to create uh, healthier banks uh, in, in the Eurozone. So that was kind of a, um, um, again, uh, 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 my reactions, and I'm still learning, um, uh, to how to interpret market prices of debt and equity in light of bailouts and low earnings. Uh, the study that I just described for the United States I am now uh, uh, collaborating with the same co-authors and one additional co-author to do for Europe. Europe is a bit more challenging because the, uh, the largest banks in Europe are split across uh, different jurisdictions. They have somewhat different uh, conditions. It's not as uniform a situation as in the US. Uh, but we hope to have data. Uh, we, hope, we already have data, but we're working on the empirics. We hope to have empirical estimates of how much uh, too big to fail has declined in Europe since the financial crisis uh, within a few months. And I hope you'll invite me back, Luke, uh, to talk about that when the numbers are ready. So with that, um, I would turn it back to you for any discussion. Yes, there was um, one question still on the previous topic of enhancing bank capital where you were advocating a floor on the level of capital. Florian Haider is wondering whether it would not be more effective to instead forbid dividends or share repurchases. Would that go a long way and would that not be easier to implement? 
Um, yeah, so um, <clears throat> so definitely that is moving in the same direction uh, because that will at least prevent uh, the capital available from going down with discretion. So it will mitigate the problem that I just described. Uh, two, two, well, actually several caveats. Number one, in the United States, banks are not being prevented uh, from paying dividends. In fact, I was a bit surprised that Chair Powell said last week that he sees no reasons uh, for banks uh, to be asked to reduce their dividend payments. Um, I wouldn't probably have said that. Not necessarily. It's not necessarily because it isn't true, uh, but rather that if things turn out badly, um, 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 it would have been better not not to uh, open the gates on that. Um, the the other issue is um, I know in Europe that banks have undertaken that they won't pay dividends and nor makes their repurchases, but that doesn't necessarily imply that they will meet a floor um, if they have negative earnings. And moreover, uh, some banks the the effect of capital uh, of a floor on capital may be different across different banks. So for some banks. Not paying out dividends may be uh, excessively onerous if they're exceeding a natural floor. And for other banks, uh, not paying out dividends might not be enough of a floor. If the objective is that banks have a given level of capital, uh, uh, then it's more um, effective to impose a floor. Now, uh, it's a different issue uh, politically because politically it's easy to explain uh, that banks shouldn't needlessly pay out cash that they may need, it's harder to tell banks, well, you've done such a great job on your risk-based capital requirements, now we're going to slap another one on you, cause your share price to go down, and, uh, and, uh, and then uh, suffer the communication challenge associated with that. Uh, so this, is, um, this would be viewed as a heavy-handed requirement. Well, from a policy viewpoint, though, I think it uh, makes it makes a lot of sense because it enhances financial stability uh, and it enhances um, credit provision and intermediation in a way that would be hard to do without something like this. Although, again, dividend pay, so restricting dividend and share repurchases is definitely going in the same direction, Florian. Thanks. Um. And there is another question from Klaus Masuch on um, the statement earlier that you made that legacy shareholders will um, not call for an increase in capital because their share prices would go down. Um, but if one sort of takes this from a welfare standpoint, um, would not this also simply reflect uh, a decline in taxpayer costs to future bailouts of banks? Absolutely. Uh, and in fact, the um, analysis that I showed you on Too Big to Fail uh, clearly shows uh, that undercapitalization of banks uh, with, a, uh, with a prospect of bailouts is a, it generates a large subsidy. Uh, so we get a we get the fact that before the financial crisis, 29% of total large bank equity was in the form of implicit subsidies associated with bailout. And this also uh, elevates the, um, uh, causes a distorted view of the health of banks from looking at their equity share prices because those are elevated when, when, uh, when there's a prospect of bailout, those are elevated by those subsidies to debt. Uh, that are coming in the form of cheap credit spreads. So I completely agree um, uh, uh, with that question, the premise of that question. And then the last question is from uh, Klaus Maso from this section. So his question is whether the public support that you are estimating here, whether this could also reflect central bank support. Um, to, uh, yeah, to the, well, there's two ways that that could happen. Number one, uh, central bank support provides liquidity. Uh, 
And uh, banks can fail for two reasons, uh, insolvency and lack of liquidity. And so uh, if, if uh, central banks uh, pro are providing less liquidity, then credit spread should rise. I don't think in the United States that the blue line in the chart shows that the Fed is supplying less liquidity and therefore credit spreads are higher. Rather, I think it's a reflection of the disappearance of too big to fail. The, uh, the, other, um, the other way that central bank liquidity uh, can support banks is that it's, in some cases, it's not actually just liquidity. Um, so in some cases, uh, central banks can uh, do whatever it takes, and sometimes that, um, and sometimes that implies more than uh, providing uh, liquidity. Okay, um, then there is a comment coming in from um, Jerome Henri. Um, he's referring to a study by Glassman and co-authors. They found that, uh, indeed, consistent with your story, uh, that after the creation of the single supervisory mechanism in the euro area, um, the measurement of potential state support has declined. And this is also consistent with not just single supervision, but also the adoption of new bail-in rules. But then, later on, again, increased more recently due to some bailout decisions in some countries. So the question is, would you also expect such indicators to fluctuate a lot more in Europe than in the US? Oh, that's a great question, very perceptive. Yeah, the, the paper by Glasserman has a very nice experiment because in 2014, there was a change in the um, uh, coverage of credit default swaps. One flavor covered bail-ins and a legacy flavor, which still traded, did not cover bail-ins. And so the difference between the two revealed to the market the likelihood of a bail-in on a, on a market-implied basis. And, um, and indeed, uh, the likelihood of a bail-in uh, increased with the single stability mechanism, and then it dropped back again with the bailout of Monte de Pasqui di Siena. Uh, so, uh, yeah, um, uh, th this um the 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 intentions um for bail-in versus not bail-in can be detected to some extent for market prices and um i as i mentioned i'm interested in what the case is in europe i i do have i mean i might even speculate um, um about the situation in europe versus the us but i don't have the results of our empirical analysis yet so i'm a bit hesitant uh to to tell you my bias which is uh, that at least in some jurisdictions in Europe, uh, there is still a high presumption of bail-in. By the way, when I gave my uh, talk about this topic last week to 500 economists, uh, it's the wonderful thing about being in a crisis. You get a lot. You get a bigger audience because there's people watching all over the world. I I uh, I asked for a poll of all the economists watching on the probability of a bail-in. In Europe, um, now going forward, and the median, the median probability assigned by 370 economists who took the poll was 80 percent. That is, the the median probability assignment that a official sector in Europe would bail out a large, uh, a large European bank was 80 percent. Uh, state support is still assumed to be very high in Europe. I was also surprised to see that the assumption of state support is very high in the U.S. So maybe uh, uh, maybe the decline in the U.S. is coming from uh, maybe a probability one of a pre-crisis bail-in uh, down to more like 75%. I don't know. We'll see. But in Europe, in Europe, yeah, I think most commentators are saying that in some jurisdictions there's more likelihood of a of a, a government support than there is in the United States at this point. So directly speaking to this, there's a question from Isabel Schnabel. Um, 
because of course things may now have rapidly changed in terms of these dynamics that you talk about since we are in the middle of a crisis. So, I mean, how likely do you think it is to have a bail-in in the midst of a crisis like the one we have today? Um, and if not, would this not naturally raise the probability of a bailout? Um, well, first of all, I think from a policy viewpoint, it's more justified to have a bailout in a uh, systemic crisis. Uh, uh, the reason being um, is that um, it's a transfer, uh, it's a government transfer um, with moral hazard, but not as much moral hazard as there would be outside of a crisis, especially a crisis uh, caused by a virus. And that if there's ever a time to do a bailout, um, it would be in a system-wide um, banking crisis uh, uh, where you're worried that bail-in might not be extremely effective. Um, that said, um, my sense is that in Europe there's no system-wide banking crisis and if banks start to reach the point of insolvency one at a time, then I would, you know, my policy viewpoint would be to stick to your guns uh, and stay the regime of bail-in, uh, and I think that will have a, um, um, uh, cr a create significant benefits. The only reason I would hesitate is if you're not confident that the bail-in process will actually work, um, um, and uh, and and you're you're more experts. You have more experts than me on knowing whether uh, your bail-in process will work. I've written a lot about this, but it's getting the the quality of the process is getting better and better especially with the treatment of uh, central counterparties, derivatives, and repos. Uh, there's still, there are still is issues, as you know, and uh, just the fact that you're able to conduct a bail-in without a failure doesn't mean that the financial institution that's left will be a significant provider of credit uh, to the economy. It, it could be that counterparties will shun that financial institution it will uh, successfully get bailed in, but shrink dramatically. Uh, and uh, if if you do that to m more than one or two banks during a stress period, that's not good for the economy, for sure. Thank you, Daryl. Um, you have two more topics to cover, right? Yeah, if you're interested, I can... Uh, We're definitely interested in the margins. Um, Maybe to close the topic on capital, there was one question that I had skipped um, that I would like to come back to by Philip Hartman. When you spoke about the capital floor proposal, doesn't the, the benefit of the effect of a capital floor depend on, high, on how high the riskiness of lending opportunities rises? Um. Okay, so well, there's a couple of issues. Yeah, uh, a couple of points in that question. So, if the if bank if the risks of bank lending going forward are high, okay. then that can be priced into bank loans, and so from the viewpoint of the health of the bank, the new loans that are made uh, will be made on better market terms because of more aggressive bidding by banks, and not cause losses for banks um, because banks won't involuntarily head in for losses. The, the, the flip side of that is that uh, if the riskiness of bank loans goes up, then the legacy loans already on the balance sheet or would be expected to experience uh, higher uh, uh, non-performance. Uh, losses will accumulate. The bank's capital will decline. Uh, maybe the accounting won't keep up with that, but um, the banks will have an incentive without a floor on capital uh, to simply, because they're of declining capital, uh, to provide uh, fewer loans, the alternative being to issue new equity, which they're, which they're loath to do in normal circumstances. You almost never see a bank doing a secondary equity offering uh, when it's under stress, uh, except in the most extreme cases, like, uh, uh, well, they have come up. And during the financial crisis here in the United States, the largest banks were forced to recapitalize uh, with a TARP backstop. And uh, th there was a beneficial effect there, actually. The increased confidence in the U.S. economy and in the banking uh, sector entirely uh, actually improved bank capitalization or imp improved share prices of banks. Uh, 
uh, coming on the uh, coming on the market wide effect of that confidence. But normally it should uh, it would not be good news for a legacy shareholder to to be forced to raise capital. Okay. So in the remaining five minutes, maybe you could speak uh, to margining which is a topic of great interest to the colleagues here. Yeah, so there are uh, several things that have come up in the last few weeks. Um, the volatility is in the equities market has been around four times normal at points, um, much higher even than during the financial crisis. Uh, volatility in treasury, U.S. Treasury markets has been exceptional. All asset classes um, have been extremely um, the, the the effective margin requirements has been extremely pro-cyclical because um, uh, central counterparties and uh, prime brokers and everybody else almost that's handling uh, margin setting has been aggressively uh, uh, taking margins um, both through reduced valuation of collateral and through higher uh, initial margin uh, or haircuts. And this has been really hard, especially in the uh, uh, market for mortgage-related securities. And you, you probably saw that um, Ronin Capital, uh, which had been speculating on uh, equity volatility, uh, was, uh, was uh, liquidated at uh, two, at two uh, large uh, clearinghouses in the US, the FICC and the CME. Um, the, as far as I understand it, uh, LCH has not increased its margin requirements um, because it already had reasonably uh, significant uh, margin requirements and haircuts. But going forward, um, if I were in the Eurozone, I would be thinking about asset classes uh, that are systemically important um, that could, if the stress continues, uh, continue uh, to uh, could uh, deteriorate and their uh, pro-cyclical effect could be set in. There have been cases in the past, as everyone uh, uh, listening today or watching today knows, in which um, BTPs, the Italian sovereign, uh, sovereign bonds, have been caught in an adverse um, uh, margin spiral, causing uh, a lot of concern. Currently, uh, BTPs are at a spread to bunts of, uh, the last time I looked a few days ago, it was 200 basis points, which uh, what I actually think is not alarming. But uh, uh, if, if uh, conditions uh, were to worsen, uh, fiscal conditions were to worsen in Italy, or the Europe-wide situation were to worsen, and uh, uh, there's a uh, risk-off uh, period, uh, it's quite possible that uh, a pro-cyclical effect could set in on that type of an asset. <clears throat> and I'm not singling out that particular asset, but that's an example that's come up before that's on my mind. Uh, so what can be done? Well, um, try, try to have margins that are already sufficient uh, for extreme events, or at least uh, moderately extreme events. Uh, some central counterparties set their margin requirements based on something like a thousand-day look-back period, which hasn't included enormous amounts of stress. And so I would tend to ensure that margins are set um, aggressively going right th back through to the last financial crisis or to scenarios that that uh, would, would incorporate um, extreme moves. <clears throat> and then be ready um, with lending of last resort uh, to those that are suffering from uh, short-term extreme margin calls but remain solvent, uh, and uh, I'm not sure exactly how you reach the non-bank uh, players in that market, but um, um, I guess that's a subject for another discussion. Thank you very much, Daryl, for your interesting presentation. Um, my last question for you is, um, you spoke now about margins, um, bank capital, um, predator support. What do you what do you see as the biggest financial risk? Also, when you compare the current crisis to the global financial crisis, what where should we have our eyes on? Is it what you just ended with the non banks? Um, where 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 do you see the concentration of risk? Uh, 
um, I see the concentration of risk in the corporate balance sheets. Um, they're, they tend to be um, not part of the financial system. I'm not as worried about the shadow banking system as a amplifier of uh, systemic risk, at least in U.S. markets. The ETFs, the mutual funds, the hedge funds, the private equity firms, are they're often viewed as significant sources of, um, of uh, uh, financial risk. Uh, so far, at least in the U.S., the banks are also um, holding up well, and that's why I think, I think this is a good time to impose um, capital requirements or restrict dividends and share repurchases uh, to, to ensure that they remain a source of strength. I view this crisis as remarkably different than the, the great financial crisis of 2007 and 8, because that was a moderate macro shock that was dramatically amplified by fragilities in the financial sector. This one is just the opposite. It's a massive macro shock that has so far not been amplified significantly, in my view, by weaknesses uh, in, uh, in financial intermediaries. Uh, and I would, just, uh, I would just want to keep it that way by keeping the financial sector a source of strength. I am much less familiar with the situation in Europe. I already mentioned my concerns about um, a small number of very large banks in Europe. And uh, if I were in the European official sector and concerned about uh, risk managing the financial sector, I would probably start, uh, start there and also uh, consider the potential for um, a, a pro-cyclical change in credit spreads of a very large sovereign issuer as, a, as another potential amplifier coming out of finance. Terrific. Thanks so much, Daryl. Um, I um, wish you uh, uh, that you stay healthy and uh, please share those results with us when they're ready. So thanks to everyone for joining. Um, tomorrow is uh, another webinar, a big shift of gears. Uh, there will be uh, Mark Lipsich from Harvard University will be talking uh, some uh, on epidemiology, uh, probably more important than the economists. Um, and uh, that's it for today.